much, Brian B. We get that lovely choice of songs. Although sometimes a song comes along and something spoils it a little bit for you. So at the, at the height of lock, my wife's going to kill me for saying this. All right. At the height of lockdown, remember lockdown? <laughs> Not lockdown. Uh, and we were we were uh, doing a, like an online uh, worship event, and it was just me and my wife, and uh, we just done the song, <laughs> Way, Waymaker, and uh, and the camera comes right in, and my wife's earnestly praying, because Lord, you are the Maywaker. <laughs> and at that moment, the camera zoomed in on me with my eyes closed, and I started to snigger. <laughs> and then the camera went even closer in on me, and I'm going. So every time we sing that song after that, I've got this Maywaker in my background, my mind. I'm sorry about that. But I want to I talk to you um, about uh, what we introduced last night, the pursuit and the pursuit of God and the pursuit, the lifelong pursuit of God. And I, I was in the uh, session that Nick led so well on retirement. And I wanted to go there because we've got lots of older people in our church at the moment and we're loving that. And we do very little for them in terms of preparing for retirement. And it was so good. I, I find it so rich being in that session. Thank you for all of you that spoke and that contributed. Because the pursuit of God is a lifelong pursuit, right? It doesn't come to an end. It's an ongoing pursuit. And, and sometimes along the way, some things happen which cause that pursuit to stop or to pause or to be derailed as well. And that's what we're talking about in our sessions uh, over the next kind of, kind of couple of days together. And I don't know about you, but over the last few weeks, there's, uh, last few weeks, last few years, there's been an overused word, and it's this word, crisis. How many crises have we had in the last three years? And of course, a crisis is something which comes up in your life. And maybe there's the midlife crisis, I thought it was really brutal how Sarah said that Tim was having a midlife crisis <laughs> yesterday. A little bit of banter, but it was... Uh, but, you know, there is the midlife crisis, and then these kind of things happen in the midlife crisis. They are, Tim. That's your next car there, or a bike. And it's for women as well. It's for women as well. And we have this kind of midlife crisis. But, you know, sometimes a crisis comes in our life because of, we talk, they talked about this in the seminar that I went to, because of change. And the struggle with change, and not just with the struggle with change, but the bigger struggle with transition as well. And I found this little uh, advert a few years ago. It's not great quality, but I love it. So just take a little look at the screen. This says so much, I think. Just take a little look. It's a tech crisis, you see, I'm just trying to, just trying to illustrate my point here, really. There we go. Emma. 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 When was the last time you were on an advert for toilet roll in church? Come on. Uh, but, but you know, change comes along our way and it's hard to adapt to it and it creates crisis. And definitely the last three years, there's been so many crises in our world that have thrown up other crises. And I'm so glad that Matt, with your young people, is looking at identity because it's not just young people who have an identity crisis these days. We're living in an identity crisis era. I think... We also have a passivity crisis as well. Uh, I want to talk about that a little bit. I think there's something out of the last three years which has been so debilitating for us as followers of Jesus, as churches, as communities, as a people, and it's created a sense of passivity, which is why I want to look at this verse that we're spending our time uh, with. It's in Judges chapter 8, verse 4. Gideon and his 300 men, exhausted yet keeping up the pursuit, came to the Jordan and crossed it. Now, now, for all you theologians, let me just deal with something. I'm taking this a little bit out of context. And I understand that. This is a story of Gideon, his 300 men. Some of you may know that story. And he's pursuing the enemy, the Philistines. And so it's about a battle. I understand that. But there's so many great biblical themes that could be encapsulated, I think, in, these very, in this very short verse. And what I want to look at is I want to look at three things 
that will help us to keep up the pursuit. And the pursuit that we said last night is the pursuit of Jesus and all that Jesus has for us. And that's a lifelong journey. I believe this is true individually, and I believe it's true for us as a church and for you as a community. And if right now you're not yet a follower of Jesus, okay, and someone's dragged you here for the weekend, and you thought you were just going for a weekend away on holiday, and you're not quite sure, we're really glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. And we hope, and I hope, that what we communicate can resonate a little bit with you as well about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to have a faith in him. And um, when, I, when I say that we've, we're in a crisis, a passivity crisis, we're also in a faith crisis right now as well. As I talk to church leaders all around the place, you know, I, I'm convinced that it's, in my living memory, it's never been easier for doubters to believe. Like, we've seen almost 100 people baptised in the last 18 months in our church. We've seen record numbers on Alpha, and that's not just us, I've seen that all around Loads and loads of new people. Never easier for doubters to believe, but also it's never been easier for believers to doubt. We're seeing loads and loads as well of people who followed Jesus for many years through this last three years of kind of the crises that have happened have rocked their faith and have rocked their sense of equilibrium and they're not running the race anymore. Like last night, they're not catching the ball and running with it. They're not keeping up the pursuit and so I, I'm aware that it may be that there's some of you who are newer to faith, some of you, so excited that many of you I spoke to last night, and, and I said, how long have you been coming to Riverside? Many of you have been coming for over 20 years. So great that you are still faithful and still running the race. But it might be that there are people here, and you're in that place where you think, oh, I'm not sure. And maybe this weekend is the last chance, and you're, before you might drop the ball and say, do you know what? I'm not sure I believe, I'm not sure I want to run the race, then I'm speaking to you. Three things are going to help us run the race. The first thing I want to speak about in this session is this, you've got to refuse to live life alone. You know, Gideon and his 300 men, he's not going to run the race on his own. And, and I, when I'm going to take that out of context, but I'll talk about it in, in a moment. When I was um, 40, several years ago, I, I went away on a three-day retreat on my own. I'm a little bit like that, okay? I kind of went into a cave and wept. Do you know what I mean? For, I'm 40. And, and, and in certain moments of your life, you, 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 come, you look in the mirror and you think, am I who I wanted to be when I was 20? I mean, the abs that I dreamed of having when I was 20. And I looked at my abs and they were more flaps than abs. And uh, you, know, you know the Jay John thing, you know, you get furniture disease when your chest falls into the drawers. <laughs> So, so you look at yourself at, at 40 and, and you evaluate life. And somebody gave me a book, which I read a lot of books. I read three to four books a month. And, and this is the, one of the, my top 10 books of all time, a book called Resilient Life by Gordon MacDonald. Anyone read it? Okay. You all need to read it like you have to. You're not a Christian if you don't read it. I'm joking. I'm joking. It is an amazing book. And it's a book where Gordon MacDonald, he wrote it probably in his 70s, he's in his 80s now. He, he looks back over his life and, and he was a runner at, at college. He was a, and, and he talks about his coach that helped him to run the race. And he talks about what does it mean to run the race well? What does it mean to finish strong? And his kind of um, premise is that you can spiritually, you can end stronger as you run, not weaker. As much as and Nick was saying that our, in the session, that of course our outward bodies are decaying, but that inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And, and he tracks it through, and he says, in every decade of your life, there are different questions that you tend to ask, and different answers that you're looking for in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s, etc., etc. I, I would recommend it to you. It is an amazing, amazing book. And in that book, he talks about resilient people. And we hear a lot about resilience these days, don't we? And I want to just pull out a few things that he says. And he says this. Listen and see if any of this resonates with you. Resilient people are committed to finishing strong. Just a few weeks ago, George Verwa, some of you may know George Verwa uh, from OM, went to be with the Lord. And then yesterday, Tim Keller, amazing author and communicator uh, from Redeemer Church in New York, went to be with the Lord. And, and, and we, we've heard such a lot in recent times of Men and women who have fallen and uh, at, almost at the, at the end of their race have, have dropped the ball and, have, and our hearts go out to them and to their families. But there are so many, 
many people who finished strong. They believe that quitting is not an option. That's what resilient people do. They're convinced that building resilience is a daily pursuit. They despise aimlessness. They have the faces of champions. They have a sense of life direction. They foresee the great questions of life. They cultivate character. They listen for a call from God. They are confident in their giftedness. They live generous lives. They understand the importance of repairing the past. They respect the power of memory. They practice repentance. They're quick to forgive. They overflow with gratitude. They squeeze the past for all of its wisdom. They keep themselves physically fit. They grow their minds. They harness their emotions. They trim their egos. They open their hearts to the presence of God. And here's where I want to go. They avoid the peril of the solitary life. They know how friendship works. They seek a certain kind of people. And then he quotes from a guy called Edward Farrell, this quote, there are certain people who enable us to be as we have never been before. Isn't that a beautiful quote? There are certain people who enable us to be as we have never been before. You know, the first problem in the Bible is not sin. The first problem in the Bible is isolation. Because when God created everything, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then he came to the point where he said, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for woman to be alone. Isolation is the biggest, is the first problem that we encounter in the Bible. And I want to suggest that isolation is something that we experience in lockdown in some senses. But now out of lockdown, we can still experience it in a different way. Isolation is such a debilitating thing. Gideon and his 300 men pursued God. David and his mighty men pursued God. Jesus, it says, a call 12 to be with him. That The Bible says that they may be with him. He appointed them that they may be with him. Even just a few months ago, we were in Israel with a, with a group and in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was such a powerful experience because... I love the story when Jesus takes those three into the garden, um, you know, to be with him. Uh, not as a lesson in anything, but because he wanted friends to be with him in his humanity. He wanted people to be with him. And on that trip to Israel, there were three women, um, uh, two, 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 uh, one for our church, uh, one that I knew of and one that I never met before. All three women had lost their sons at very young ages, one through... Uh, illness, one through a drug overdose, and one tragically, which I'll talk about in a minute, through taking his own life. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, these three women are going to get emotional. These three women are connected with each other through the trip. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was our last day, Gethsemane means crushing. It means that place of crushing and of suffering. Underneath an olive tree, these three women were sat under an olive tree, praying with each other, weeping with each other, thought that's the power of relationship isn't it these three women got it you know none of the rest of us really understood what it's like to lose a son in tragic circumstances at a young age but all three of them did because there are certain people who enable us to be as we've never been before Kerry Newoff who writes a lot of stuff at the leadership stuff that a lot if you're into that uh, he, he, he says this very famously he said solitude is a gift from God isolation is a tool of the enemy Solitude is very different from isolation. In fact, I was reading just before I put it up on the screen, because I was reading just this week, a guy called Paul Tillich, he said, solitude expresses the glory of being alone, but loneliness expresses the pain of being alone. Interesting. Solitude's a good thing. And, and this is, I'm, I'm not talking about introvert, extrovert. How many of you would say you're an extrovert? Put your hand up straight away. Yeah, you are. I mean, you're an introvert, you don't even want to put your hand up. Okay, I get it. My wife is a massive introvert and I'm a bit of an extrovert. In fact, at my 50th birthday, my wife said to me, right, you've got a choice. Do you want a big present? Do you want a big party? Or do you want a big holiday? I said, that's a really difficult choice, darling. <laughs> uh, so I said, let's do the big holiday. So we went on a big holiday with some friends. It was amazing, touring around Italy. While I was away, the church had clubbed together and bought me a brand new bike which was great, it was in my office when I got home, so I had the big present as well. And then I said, could we just have a little get-together get at our house? <laughs> just 
Do you know, I promise I won't invite many people. Just like a Sunday afternoon drop in, my birthday's in July, July the 16th, if you're making noise. <laughs> um, I said, just a few people to drop in. She said, just a few people to drop in, because she's an introvert and my son's an introvert who's living at home at the time. I invited 185 people. <laughs> Thinking to myself, they won't come because it's the summer, they all came. All right? At the end of the time, when they've gone home, we have a quite small house and they kind of been, my wife and my son were banging their head against the wall. Like, Make it stop, make it stop. She loves people, but she's an introvert. But I want to say, relationships are not just about extroverts. All of us are created to do life with other people. We've got to figure that out, what that means. But it's not a good thing for us to be alone. Enable us to be as we have never been before. In fact, the Harvard Happiness Study, a very famous study, began in the 30s, lasted decades, where they, where they surveyed people over that period about the whole happiness thing. There were seven key factors. Number one was the quality of our relationships. And the older that you get, the more those relationships can be important, the older that you get. You see, the problem is that without good relationships, when we're running this race, when we're keeping up the pursuit, you and I get stuck, right? We get stuck. And I remember many, many years ago, I was on my own as it happened, and I, I fly, flew, flew, fly, flew out to um, Bulgaria. We, I've been going to Bulgaria for over 30 years. Uh, and we have a church in Albania as well, so, so really in, in, involved in, in the Balkans. And, and I was on my own on one of these trips, which I very rarely am. And it had been brilliant. Like, there'd been so many people come to faith. There'd been loads of amazing stuff. And I was younger. Uh, my kids were young at the time. And I was flying back uh, through Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. And I was sitting waiting for the connecting flight. And I was feeling a little bit good. Like, like God, God had been good, but I'd been even better. You know what I mean? It's that, it's that sense of, like, that ego thing of, like, amazing. This has been so good. And then I realised, I had a bit of time. But I really need the toilet. Because preachers also need the toilet as well. Realize. And so I went into the cubicle, and it's Charles de Gaulle Airport, but there was nobody there. Uh, and so, it's really, it's got nobody here. So I went into the cubicle, and I shut the door, and locked the door, and the handle fell off on the other side of the door. That's fine, no problem. So I did what I needed to do, no more information. And then I thought, right, now I need to get out. And I couldn't get out. And I thought, okay, time's going now, and nobody came to the toilet. It was like the rapture had happened, <laughs> and I was left behind. And, um, and so all of a sudden, then I'm thinking, I need to get out. Like I said, but I've watched Die Hard, I've watched Bruce Willis films. How hard can it be to break open this door? So I start trying to break the door open. Have you ever tried to do that? It's a little bit harder than you think. And I couldn't get out of it. I really have to get out now. So I noticed that there's a gap at the top of the door. So I'm starting to climb out of the gap. And this was years ago, and I've, I've lost quite a lot of weight since then. So as I was climbing out over the gaps, true story, my head went out, my shoulders went out, my chest went out, my stomach got me stuck. And so I'm stuck, literally hanging over the top of the toilet door, and I think, there's nobody there, I'm gonna miss my flight, and I might die in a toilet in Paris Airport. And then my phone's in my pocket, so I take my phone out, and I, I don't know who else to phone, like it was years ago, so I phoned home. And my mum was babysitting my kids. And so I phoned and said, Mum! She says, aren't you overseas somewhere? I said, yes, I'm stuck in a toilet in Paris. <laughs> She says, you're always messing about. Hold on, put the phone down. <laughs> At that moment, a fellow walked into the toilet and he sees me hanging over top of the toilet. And I'm thinking, he must be French, so I try out my best French, you know, like, like Del Boy on, on Very Ford and Orson. And, and he's a brummy. All right, mate, you're stuck in the toilet, yeah. you? And he, and he let me go and I got out. Because you and I, get stuck in life, don't we? And without other people, we stay stuck. We stay stuck. So I want to ask you some questions uh, today. I want to go to some questions that Gordon MacDonald asks in the book, and I'm just going to flip through them very quickly. They're such good questions. Number one, who coaches you? He says there are certain people who enable you to be who's never been. So who coached you? Who kind of comes alongside you? Who disciples you? Who teaches you? Who helps you? Who stretches you? Who stretches you? You know, who, who stretches me? I love meeting with Tim. Tim stretches me uh, because of the way he thinks. And, and when we get together and have coffee, there's that sense of, hey, I, when I go away from our coffees, I feel better than before. Because there are certain kind of people who enable you to be as you've never been before. Who stretches your mind and your thinking? Who listens to you and encourages your 
your dreams. And as we've asked you the second question, you know, I've noticed we're terrible at asking the second question. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. That's the first question. But now, the second question takes our relationship deeper, doesn't it? And then the third question, who asks you, who listens to you and encourages your dream? Who cries with you? Do you have people that you could just say, life sucks right now? And, and that you could just, and, and, and as guys, what, 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 God, come on, who, who have we got that we can actually be real with? Such a massive issue. Who challenges you? Who loves you enough to tell you the truth? Oscar Wilde says a true friend is someone who stabs you in the front. <laughs> who have you got that loves you enough to tell you the truth? It's so, so important. Who seeks God with you? Who prays with you and for you? And who has fun with you? So important. And, and these kind of questions help us to assemble in our life various people and I don't want to put pressure or guilt on any of you. I haven't got all of these right now. But I know that there are certain people that when we're with them, our life is better. And it helps us to keep up the pursuit of God, right? And I want to encourage you to think around those kind of issues. You see, without others in our life, we lose perspective of who we really are. Without others in our life, we can't see our blind spots. And you might say, I don't have any blind spots. That's your blind spot. Right there, we all have blind spots, and by definition, we can't see them. So to have other people who can help us. One of the things I love, I mean, Elim and our regional leader, who's on our national issue team, is so great at this. He, he regularly says to us as a team, I'm on the regional team. Please tell me what I'm not seeing about myself. And so every year we have a whole activity where where we feed back to him things that he's good at, things that he that that that, that we value, but also things that we think he needs to look at. And that's such refreshing in leadership, isn't it? To say, I don't see my blind spots. That's why I need others around me who do. Because there are certain people who enable us to be as we've never been before. But you know, without others, we're at risk when it comes to the battle for our soul. Without others, we can't see how exhausted we really become. Um, I said last night that uh, in March 2020, my... Mother passed away the week before, the funeral was a few days before lockdown, then lockdown, then our first granddaughter was born, then trying to lead the church through lockdown, etc, uh, etc. Et and as we came into 2021, I was fried, absolutely fried, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. And our elders, they're a great team. They saw that, they recognised that, and they said, you need some time off. And they gave me a couple of months off in the summer of 2021, kind of like a sabbatical. It was a two-month thing, but in, on week six, Friday the 13th of August, I shall never forget the day, I had a call that pulled me back from sabbatical because somebody, um, family in our church, their son, who's 39, had taken his own life and the life of his three-year-old son. It made national news. And we were first on the scene. We were there when his sister came. We were there when his parents came. We were there when his family. They used to be in our church many, many years ago. And, and it was incredibly traumatic. And we knew each other. And I have a son with special needs who's got very complex uh, additional needs and he's in residential care and, and, and they just couldn't cope with, with this little boy. And um, uh, in, in the letter that he wrote, in, in the suicide letter, I, I, my name was in the letter because his family has said to him many times, why don't you talk to Leon? Why don't you talk to Leon? He gets it, he understands it. And in the letter he says, I know I could talk to Leon but nothing would change. And uh, I just, just, like, it was just such a... Uh, Powerful moment when I realised how desperate people can get. And there's no judgment in me towards him at all. How desperate people can get when they think nothing can change. And that feeling of, he had so many friends. And the funeral was so full of so many people. And yet they were like, we never saw it. We never saw it coming. And I want to say to you, and I'm not, I don't want to be overdramatic. I want to say to you, please don't live like that. Please don't ever think that there's nobody that can listen. When we get into that place of isolation, the word isolation in the original Greek is thanatos. It literally means death. And it's that place of isolation. It's almost, it's why Jesus, it's why God said, it's not good for people to be alone. Isolation is the first big problem that we read of. And so I want to I kind of tease this out with you a little bit. Because when we get exhausted and we don't have people in our life, bad things can happen, Right? And actually, there are categories of exhaustion. The word that is used in Hebrew in Judges chapter 8, verse 4, for exhaustion, literally means faint, weary, thirsty, hungry, languid. There's tired, there's fatigued, 
and there's exhausted and they're different. And, and you and I are tired often and we're fatigued often, but when we get exhausted, that's a whole different conversation. You see, for Gideon, look at the causes of exhaustion. I mean, physically, he was exhausted. He'd been fighting with 300 men. That's, that's hard work. He was mentally exhausted. He was fighting against the odds. He was emotionally exhausted. Because a few verses before, in Judges 8 verse 1, it says, Now the Ephraimites asked Gideon, why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. In other translations it says, they criticized him sharply. So he was out there fighting for them, but they criticized him because he didn't call them to be with him. How many of you know the church can be the only army that shoots its own wounded at times? Maybe you know what it's like to be physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. And when that happens, there are consequences of exhaustion. You see, there's internal collapse. One of my favorite characters in the Bible is Elijah. And I love what it says in James chapter 5. It says, Elijah was a man. What does it say? You know? Just like us. Elijah was a man just like us. Then I read the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 17, that Elijah goes to Ahab. The most powerful man on the planet. So like going into Putin, you know, into the Kremlin. And, and he prophesies there will be no rain on the land until I say it. And then he walks out. And then he goes into hiding and, and he's miraculously fed by ravens. And then he ends up um, in, a, in, a, in a, a widow's house and, and, and the widow's son dies. And he stretches his, himself out over the widow and over the son. And the son comes to life. Then he's in 1 Kings 19. He's on the top of the mountain. He calls down fire. And the Bible says Elijah was a man just like us. How many of you have a week like that? <laughs> like, I'm a guest. It's nothing like me. Do you know what I mean? That's like, I wouldn't do any of those things. But then in 1 Kings 19, after the mountain, after the fire, when he runs past the chariot, okay, he gets to a place where he says in 1 Kings 19 to his attendant, the guy who was doing life with him, I want to be on my own. Danger. Isolation. And he heads into the desert and then he ends up under a tree and he says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. And then I realized Elijah was a man just like us. How many of us all felt like that at times? Maybe not ever said, I want to take my life, but we said, I've had enough, Lord. Anyone then said that? Or is it just me? Said, I've had enough, Lord. And, and when I look at that, I think there's an internal collapse that goes on because Elijah was exhausted. And in that process of exhaustion, he got himself isolated and when you do that you say things you don't really mean and you lose total perspective I mean do something with you for a moment if you're able if you're legally able to do this okay if you're not I apologize just close one eye for a moment okay, just close one eye. and put your thumb in front of the other eye and just look at me okay through your thumb what looks bigger me or your thumb that's the question what looks bigger me or your thumb your thumb it's not but you lost perspective. And, and when we get exhausted, when we get exhausted and when we get isolated from others, we lose all sense of perspective. So what's big appears small and what's small appears big. And what's far away appears close and what's close appears far away. And so Ahab's wife Jezebel said to Elijah, in one day, I'm going to kill you. And the Bible says, read the text, in one day in the desert, he sits under a tree and says, I've had enough, Lord, I want to die, take my life. She said, in one day, you'll be dead. In one day, he got to the tree. That tree of the kind of defeat should have been a tree of celebration. Because she said, in one day, you'll be dead. He got to that tree and he wasn't dead. But he lost perspective. And you and I, when we get exhausted, can lose perspective. That's why we need other people. That's why it's not good for us to be alone. That's why we need others. Because when we find a certain type of people, they enable us to be we have never been before and that internal collapse can lead to an external collapse as well it can lead to a moral failure it can lead to blowing it I, don't you feel sorry for Moses in that one moment when he when he, when we were in Israel we were in Jordan as well we went on to Mount Nebo where where Moses got to look out over the promised land and and I just again felt so sorry for Moses because in that moment of anger he lost so much you and I can our finest moment can be erased sometimes by our final moments. And we all know about that. And so internal collapse can lead to external collapse as well. So as we kind of draw into a close in a minute, I want to ask you a question. This is going to feel a little bit heavy, okay? I hope it doesn't be too heavy on the weekend. 
away. Okay, we will have some fun. All right, we'll be fine. But I want to ask you a question. How are you doing, really? Not how are you doing, because you're going to say, fine. But how are you doing, really? And, and again, Carrie knew off. <laughs> He, he, he gives us some helpful things, 11 things, 11 questions. And, and, and these are little markers of, of when you're not just tired. We all get tired. And we're not just fatigued, so we all get fatigued. But when we're exhausted, and when we've been exhausted for too long. And when we're exhausted for too long, lots of stuff's happening. And actually, without others in our life, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it. We're not reading it. We're not understanding it. We're not embracing it. We're not dealing with it. And these are... Your main emotion is numbness. Little things become big things. You know, you lose that sense of perspective. What's big appears small. What's small appears big. What's close appears far away. What's far away appears close. Everybody drains you. You ever felt like that? <laughs> Not just a few people, but everybody drains you. You're becoming cynical. So easy to become cynical the older that you get. I don't want to be a cynical older follower of Jesus. Do you? I don't want to be cynical. I don't want to be, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. You know, I, I, I catch myself sometimes with some of our younger guys, and, oh, yeah, 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 I used to think like that. That's cynicism. I don't ever want to be like that. Nothing satisfies you. You can't think straight. Your productivity is dropping. You self-medicate. When I say self-medicate, I don't just mean drugs or alcohol, but I mean things like social media. Things like Netflix. No, nothing wrong with any of that. But actually, I'm reaching for it because I'm self-medicating. Because I think I deserve it because I'm entitled. And because actually, I'm exhausted. And yet, rather than deal with exhaustion, I'm self-medicating. You don't laugh anymore. Sleep and time off no longer refuel you. It's quite sobering, isn't it? And I hope none of you are thinking, yep, yeah, house, bingo, goal 11. Okay. But maybe there are some. And that's hit something in. Hey, a weekend like this, isn't this great? There's some space. Not necessarily to solve everything, but to at least to make room. To make room for God to speak. Maybe to make room for others to speak into your life as well. Because deep down, you and I, we want to run the race well, don't we? We want to keep up the pursuit. But if we're going to do that, we have to refuse to do life alone. There are certain people who enable us to be as we've never been before. So, if you are a little exhausted, maybe right now, some of this stuff has hit a nerve. What do you do? I'm mixing the metaphors a bit, but what, what we do is we notice the signs. So, so, so in your car and your, your dashboard, you have some lights that flash, don't you? And we all have them. We all have little lights and little indicators. And maybe that list of 11 things is like that for you. So we recognize the, si the signs. But then what we do is we don't keep driving. We don't keep driving. Have you ever done that? I mean, I've done it sometimes with a light on the dashboard. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to keep driving. I'm just going to keep driving and it will go away. I'm just going to keep driving and it will go away. And of course, it doesn't go away. So we pull over. And then when we pull over, we get some help. We open the bonnet. We allow others who, who know more than us to speak into it. But ultimately, what we do is we invite the mechanic to do what he does best. Going back to the Elijah story, that's the band just. What I love about the Elijah story so much is when we see Elijah in that place under the tree, the angel of the Lord comes to him. And God does this really annoying thing that God tends to do. Ask a really obvious question. What are you doing here, Elijah? It's the same kind of questions that Jesus asks all the time. The question isn't for God's benefit, is it? For us. It's about trying to locate where we are. How are you really? And then, and then what he does is he gives Elijah a six-week break. And, and so he gives him a holiday. And maybe for some of us, all we need, okay, in our kind of, you know, where we're at right now, is just a break. And that's fine. And, and in that six-week break, he, he attends to his, his physical needs and, and he gets some good cooking and some good food. But maybe that's not enough. And, and he finds himself in this cave. And then God meets him. In the cave. But what's really fascinating to me is that God does the whole Steven Spielberg special effects thing, doesn't he? With the earthquake and the wind and the fire. And then the Bible says, but God wasn't in that. But God created that, so God did that. But God wasn't really in that. Because God was in, what was he in? The 
gentle whisper, the still, small voice. And it's almost like all that dramatic stuff was like God showing Elijah that the ability to hear the voice of God is actually more important than the ability to control the forces of nature. So God showing him, this is who I am and this is what I can do. But the most important thing is that you hear my voice. And do you want to know what, lean in a little bit, do you want to know what God whispered to Elijah in the cave? This is, it doesn't take long. Do you want to know what he whispered? I have no idea. Whatever it was, it was enough to bring him out of the cave. So, I want us to create a little bit of time, a little bit of space. We want to make room for the Holy Spirit, maybe to speak to you, and maybe for some of you. And again, I know there are a load of metaphors. I'm a bit of a metaphor person. I'm always confused by all the metaphors. But right now, let's just stick with the cave, okay? Maybe you feel yourself in a bit of a cave. A bit of a cave of exhaustion. A bit of a cave of isolation. Not that you're lonely. Not that there aren't people in your world. But you know you've got yourself isolated. And in that space of exhaustion, where maybe there is some numbness, maybe there is some cynicism, maybe there is some self-medication, maybe there is some, you know, just that sense of like, do you know what? Just not running the race anymore. Just not passionate right now. Just not pursuing right now because I am so exhausted. God looks at you not with judgment or condemnation, but love and longing. And he wants to whisper to you, and a cave is fine for a time. A cave is not fine for a life. Fine for a time is not fine for a life. And I don't know what God needs to whisper to you to bring you out of the cave. But what I know is that as Elijah came out of the cave, he began the second half of his life, which was, <laughs> which was so important because the second half of the life was go and find this guy, go and find this guy called Elisha. Invest yourself into this guy. He's going to do even greater things than you did because there is meaning and purpose in the second half of our life, but not when we're stuck in a cave. So I want us just to maybe close our eyes for a moment. And if you can, just shout out everybody else for a moment. I know I'm saying for a few to do life alone, but just for a moment. And maybe some of us are in that cave. Maybe some of us feel like we're in that cave of exhaustion. We're in that cave of isolation. Maybe some of us are in that cave of disappointment. If I was, I was praying for this session today, that there are some of you, and life has thrown you some curveballs that you didn't see coming. And disappointment is palpable for you right now. You just feel, you just feel like something, someone punched you in the stomach and you feel winded. And you feel so winded that all you can do is sit in that cave Just believe that God wanted to say, hey, I am bread. I am the life. I am the one that brings breath. I am the one that in your disappointment can turn that disappointment into meaning and into purpose. And what you don't see, I do see. I, 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 you can't see the way ahead right now, but I do see because I see the end from the beginning. And I'm the author and the perfecter. And if I'm the author, it means I'm the one with the pen, not you. I'm the one writing the stories, not you. And so you don't... You As this chapter closes, I'm about to write a brand new chapter. But don't stay in the cave longer than you show up. And I just sense that God, by his spirit, wants to speak into your cave right now, speak into your life. And whatever it is that he whispers is going to be enough to bring you out of that cave. So I'm going to shut up for a moment. And let's just listen to God. And then we'll just pray more.
place of standing, right? Some of you, I want to sit down because you feel so exhausted right now. Some of you feel like you're in that place. Some of you, you are desperate to hear God say something that will bring you out. Some of you feel isolated right now. If that's you, sit down again. If that's you, just sit. We want to pray for you. Because there's something about, yeah, we know we need to stand and we know we need to run. incredible book, sit, walk and stand, you know that sometimes you just need to sit for who God is, and so if that's you right now, you know you're in that place, would you just sit for a moment, because we want to pray for you up in the balcony area as well, if you'd like to do that as well, if you want to just sit, would you just sit and this is not failure this is not failure this is honesty, this is this is reality. This is where God meets us. God meets us at this point of honesty and vulnerability and reality. He said, the truth will set you free. Whatever it is, I'm exhausted. I'm fed up. I'm cynical. I'm disappointed. That's the truth. We name that, and then we begin to tame that. This is the truth that sets us free. So we want to pray. And if you're stood up for a moment, would you would you look around and your church and your family and just, just don't put a hand gently, appropriately on someone's shoulder to say, why don't you just begin to pray for them? Just begin to pray. You don't, don't ask him anything. Just pray. Just pray for the Spirit to fill them. Just pray for God to speak to them over this weekend. Just pray for there to be breath in their lungs again. Just pray for there to be that sense of God at work. Just pray into whatever you sense. But don't ask them, but just pray for them and speak over them. Father, we speak over these amazing people who are sat before you now and God we just speak blessing over them, we speak your spirit we speak your power, we speak your word Lord whatever it is that they need whatever is okay whatever it is that they need to hear may they hear your still small voice and it would be great if it was over this weekend but Lord if it's not then, then keep us tuned in till we hear your voice speak again and Lord whatever it takes to draw us out of that cave again we pray that you would do it in Jesus name seminar I went to, somebody mentioned, I think it was Nick, mentioned about seasons as a way to look at retirement and it's really interesting because I just wonder whether some of us, we're in a season not necessarily retirement and we don't feel like we're passionate, we don't feel like we're running with the Lord, I I believe Jesus is saying to you, faithfulness is being faithful in this season maybe you're looking at how you once were or how you want to be I think God wants to take something off your shoulders Take the pressure off that. But I can't get up in the morning and pray because I've got the little kids here. Or I can't do that because I've got elderly parents. And Jesus is saying to you, faithfulness is being faithful in that season. It looks different in each and every season. Take the pressure off yourself. Jesus is just saying, hey, you're being faithful. Well done. to the team and we'll worship for a little bit and make room for the spirit. I want to ask you one more question. Is Who is there? Who's somebody in your life that you need to maybe reach out to? Because there are certain people who enable us to be as we've never been before. Where have you got yourself isolated? Maybe you need to find someone who you can have fun with. I realized recently that I've got a lot of those others, but, but my fun people, um, I, I just got myself too busy. And that's dangerous. And so I'm leaning back into the fun people again because that's where I need to be right now. Maybe for you, you need to find someone who can pray with you or someone who can pray for you or someone who can challenge you or someone who can encourage you. And, and as the name comes to your mind, 